Good morning. The Lord be with you. And welcome to our online service here for October 23rd. The Lord has the other word after last week's word. Last week he spoke to those who were ready to give up. This week he has a word for those who think they're all that. Well, this is incredible the way our Lord treats us in these two parables last week and this week. Check it out. Take a look again last week if you want to know what I mean. In any case, he comes to us now and draws near. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and always ready to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour down on us the abundance of your mercy. Forgive us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and give us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except by the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Second Timothy, chapter 4. St. Paul writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. 
To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And, and the Holy Gospel reading according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing even infants to him, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Fellow baptized saints, there are but two religions in the world, the religion of the law and the religion of the gospel. In the religion of the law, you work your way up to God. In the religion of the gospel, God comes down to you. In the religion of the law, you earn God's favor. In the religion of the gospel, God's favor is undeserved. We call it grace, a gift. In the religion of the law, you justify yourself. In the religion of the gospel, God justifies you. Now, of course, there are many religions of the law that go by many names with many gods and with many ways to those many gods. You may worship a false god or you may worship the true god falsely. It doesn't matter when it comes to the religion of the law. The religion of the law brings death and destruction, whether you worship a false god or the true god in the false way. Because here's the problem. A natural-born sinner cannot be justified by the law. The law kills. The commandment condemns. The religion of the law, though it promises grace and every blessing to all who keep the commandments, ultimately fails. Because there is no one who keeps the commandments. Not you, not me, not anyone. There may be many religions of the law, but there is one religion of the gospel. The one that approaches God not by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of what Jesus has done. Not with commandment keeping, but with promise believing. There is only one religion that works this way. It's called Christianity even though admittedly many Christians slip into the religion of the law and make forgiveness, life, and salvation something somehow we do. Be careful. Even if our part in it is a tiny part, just a little spark of something good, a little leaning in the right direction, a little helping God along by making the right decision, 
It's the religion of the law, not the gospel. Two brothers went out into the field to make a sacrifice to God, sons of the same mother and father. They both believed in the same God, the God of their father and mother. Now the elder brother, Cain, worked the soil. He offered God some of the fruit of the ground. The younger brother, Abel, he was a herdsman, and he offered the firstborn of his flock, the very best portions of it. The Lord recognized Abel and his sacrifice. The Lord did not recognize Cain and his. Why? Well, the text of Genesis doesn't say but the book of Hebrew tells us, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was received and he received approval as righteous, God bearing witness by accepting his gifts. It wasn't the size of the sacrifice, nor was it because Cain offered fruit and Abel offered an animal. Now uh, there's this little hint in the text that Cain's sacrifice was less than sacrificial, simply some of the fruit of the ground. A bit like the change left in your pocket, or whatever small bills might be in your wallet. Abel, by contrast, offered the best portions of the firstborn of his flock. It wasn't the gift, but the orientation of the giver that was decisive. Abel's sacrifice was faithful, full of faith trust in the promise of God. Whereas Cain's sacrifice was faithless. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Do you see? Both men worship the same God. Cain worshiped God according to the religion of the law and was rejected. Abel worshiped God according to the religion of the gospel and was received. But this led to a crisis, the first holy war. Cain was angry with his brother because the Lord rejected his sacrifice. It wasn't his brother's fault, but isn't that the way it is? We'd rather blame our brother than look at ourselves. And that's where the religion of the law will lead, to offering the blood of your brother if necessary, anything to justify yourself. Two men went to the temple to pray. Both were Israelites. Both worshipped the same God, the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One man was a Pharisee, a religious man, belonging to a very conservative religious group. He was respected by his community, admired for his good works. He worked hard to do the works God required. He was proud of what he had achieved in his piety, his discipline, his religion. He fasted twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. He, he gave a tenth of everything he took in, right down to the herbs from his garden. The other man was a publican, a tax collector. He was an Israelite too, though his own people despised him. He worked for the Roman government as a tax agent. He paid the tax of his region to Caesar in return for a license to collect whatever he could from his own people. He was probably fairly well off, had a nice house, threw great parties with his tax collector friends, but he was hated by his fellow Israelite, and especially those Pharisees who saw him as a traitor to God and country. These two men, the Pharisee and the tax collector went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, standing off by himself, prayed according to the law. First, he justifies himself on the back of his fellow man. God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, cheaters, swindlers, the sexually immoral, or even that tax collector over there. And then, according to the law again, he justifies himself on the basis of his own works. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. And he was certain that God must agree with him. 
The tax collector also stood alone, far away. He couldn't even lift his eyes, much less his face to heaven. Instead, he looked at the ground and beat his breast and said nothing more than, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee asked for nothing from God. The publican asked for nothing but mercy. The Pharisee came with the record of his good works, and the record was long and impressive. The tax collector came with his sin. The Pharisee offered a tenth of everything he had. The tax collector offered his sinful, broken life. I tell you, this man, the one who could not lift his eyes to heaven, the one who prayed for mercy, the tax collector, this man went down to his house justified, declared righteous, forgiven. Can you believe it? Not the religious Pharisee, but the sinful tax collector. He went home justified by God. How? By grace. God's undeserved kindness, through faith, trust in the promise that God justifies the ungodly solely on the basis of his promise of mercy delivered for Christ's sake. The publican worshipped God in the way of the gospel through faith in God's promise, and God justified him. If you exalt yourself with the law, you will be humbled. You will be revealed to be a sinner, the chief of sinners. No matter how religious you may be, the law will always accuse you, always humble you, always shut your mouth, amplify your sin, and ultimately kill you. That's what the law does to sinners. If you attempt to worship God according to the law, to earn his favor with your commandment keeping, your piety, your good works, your religion, you will not be justified but condemned. Even if you worship the true God, it doesn't matter. Because to worship God in the way of the law is to treat God like an idol. That means it's pointless to argue whether or not Jews or Muslims worship the true God or not. It doesn't matter. They worship according to the religion of the law, seeking the righteousness of God through works rather than trust. And it also means that even those who call themselves Christians, and that includes you and me, slip into the same religion, the religion of Cain and of the Pharisee. Whenever that is that we seek to earn God's favor by the way of the law instead of the gospel, by what we do instead of what God has done in Christ for us. So pay attention to yourself. Ah, <laughs> but if you are humbled under that law, then you will be exalted. Like the tax collector who went home justified. Like Abel, whose martyr's blood testified from the ground to the promise of God. God justifies the ungodly, not the already godly. He forgives sinners, not saints. He acquits the guilty, not the innocent. Don't hide your sins. Don't compare yourself favorably to others. Don't boast before God of what you've done for him lately. And by all means, don't attempt to justify yourself before the cross of Jesus. Confess your sins. Own them. They're yours. Come to God not with an armload of good works over which to brag, but to throw your sins on Christ and hold up empty, open arms like a beggar, eager to receive his gracious gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. This is true worship. And why the liturgy matters, so that Christ may lead you in this, as he serves you grace upon grace in his word and sacrament all the way to heaven. It's so beautiful. Now, <laughs> did you notice what happened Right after Jesus tells this parable, it sounds like some people were listening. Maybe not his own disciples, but parents. Luke tells us 
They were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. The tiniest of babies. <clears throat> now what did those squirming, crying, helpless infants have to offer to Jesus? Why, absolutely nothing. Which is the whole point. There is nothing more useless than an infant if you're concerned with doing good works. And the disciples, they try to stop those parents from wasting Jesus' time. But you see, it's the infants, the helpless, that worship in the way of the gospel. They can't do the law. They can't speak. They can't move on their own. And we can't do the law either. In truth, we are in no better shape than those helpless babies who have to be brought to Jesus. But Jesus says, no, let these children come to me and don't get in their way. For to such helpless ones as these belongs the kingdom of God. Infants. Well, if you didn't before, you now understand infant baptism. Infants are the perfect targets for baptism. They are ready-made beggars, utterly helpless. Everything has to be done for them. They even have to be brought they can't bring themselves. In fact, you might say that all baptism is infant baptism, even when it happens to an adult. Because it's not that infants are inherently good. They're not. They're infected with sin like the rest of us. It's that they are receivable, utterly giveable to. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. That's why Luther said that the baptism of an infant is a perfect picture of our salvation. The child does nothing. God does everything. Baptism is precisely how believing parents bring their infants to Jesus for a blessing. Well, where else are you going to go? Where are you going to bring your babies so Jesus might touch them? To the font. To baptism. Dear ones, you have been baptized into the religion of the gospel. You have been declared dead to sin and dead to the law and all its religion. Yours is the worship of Abel, who offered the full faith sacrifice in view of Christ's sacrifice. Yours is the religion of the publican, who could not lift his eyes to heaven, but sought the mercy of God in Christ. Yours is the religion of the tiny infant in the arms of Jesus receiving the kingdom, and letting him carry you up. And in this religion of the gospel, of trust in the free promise of life in Christ, you go home justified. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. It is time to pray. Call on our Lord for mercy. Be confident this is what he wants and that he's going to respond. We have much to pray for, for courage, for faith, for patience. Yes, let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty Father, we come to you at the gracious invitation of your Son. May we receive your gifts as little children, that no rebuke of our sinful flesh, the world, or the devil would deter us from turning to you in repentance. Grant us humility to pray, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be merciful to your church, particularly a Lutheran Church of the Redeemer, but also in every place. Defend our pastors from arrogance and pride and strengthen them in the faithful preaching of your word that both your holy law and your precious gospel would be proclaimed and your children be united in saving faith by the way of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As your son welcomed infants, 
Give us a deep care for the children entrusted to us, that we would defend their lives even before birth. Instill in parents a desire and commitment to bring their little children to Jesus. Use Lutheran schools, our Sunday school, Bible classes, and youth catechesis to preserve them in the faith. And teach each of us in humility to receive the kingdom of God like a little child. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you do not delight in the wickedness or let the boastful stand before you. Give the leaders of, of the nations wisdom to govern in accordance with your will. Keep them mindful of the stewardship that they hold on behalf of others, that they may fulfill their duties with diligence and humility. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, we praise you that you deliver our souls from death and our feet from falling. Care for those who are near death. Preserve them from despair and give them a confident hope in the resurrection promises of our risen Lord and come to the aid of everyone in need including those that we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, if we trust in ourselves for righteousness, we are lost and dead in our sins. Yet you mercifully draw us to yourself in repentance and hear the cries of those who trust in your Son. Grant us humility, that we may not exalt ourselves or treat other, our brothers and sisters with contempt. Rescue us from every evil, and bring us into your kingdom as your beloved children. To you alone be all glory, O Father, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom, O Lord, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Yes, dear ones, treasure the way of the gospel and never depart from it. Anytime you find yourself off track, just jump back on, turn right back. It's the way of mercy, and now all is forgiven. So God grant you much peace this week in that way, and um, great courage that this is uh, our Lord's way from beginning to end. Uh, so uh, take take a tune in to uh, all of Jordan's emails there for more details about upcoming call meetings and other things. And the Lord grant you much peace in His in His Word.